Hi, I'm Tony Northrup, and as part of my continuing series of overview tutorials for specific cameras, I'm going to be covering the Sony A7 family of cameras. I'm trying to take on the entire family here because those A7 cameras are built virtually identically. There's four if I tell you how to use the buttons and controls on one. You'll probably be able to use any of the cameras. If you have a different camera, or if you have a friend who has a different camera and you want to be able to share this with them, go to sdp.io slash tutorials, and there you'll find our ever-growing list of cameras that we've covered. I don't try to cover every single feature of the camera. In fact, I leave out some things that I think aren't that important. Instead, I focus on those features that will actually make a difference in your photography, especially if you're working through my photography book, Stunning Digital Photography. I will also note that if you have the A7S and you're interested in the video features of that, I'll come out with a separate video around A7S video because it does have a lot of unique features. So first, let's talk about just the basic physical parts of the camera. You might have figured this out already, in which case you can look at the table of contents in the description and skip forward to a different part of the video. There's no need to watch any part of this that you already know. Jump around just to the stuff you want. If you already know everything about the camera, Maybe just jump forward to my lens recommendations for some interesting parts of it. But the first thing you'll want to do when you get your camera is, of course, put a lens on. The lenses screw on clockwise. You'll line up the white dot here with the white dot on the body there, and then twist to the right until it clicks. Then I always wiggle it back and forth just to make sure it's locked in there. Another thing that you'll have to do before you can take a picture is open up the battery compartment here and just slide the battery right in. Now, Sony does not include a charger with your camera. Instead, you'll charge it with the USB port, which is, uh, just have to slide that up to lock it in there. You'll charge it with the USB port, which is here, hidden away in this compartment. And that can be a little tricky. It doesn't charge off of every USB port. It will charge with the wall charger, though. You might want to buy a battery charger, which will cost you about 20 bucks with a couple of generic batteries that won't last you all that long. But that's kind of what we do. We do a little bit of both. When I'm traveling, I love being able to charge with that USB port. One last compartment you need to worry about before you can take that first picture, that's the memory card compartment, which is right here. Now, on this particular camera they, that slides out sideways, you'll just click it to take it out. On the Sony a7S, it slides out forward. Any standard SD card will do. You don't need to spend a lot on a fast SD card unless you plan to record high quality video. If you're going to be recording, like you want 50 megabytes per second video out of this thing, that highest quality video, you're going to need a fast, expensive card. If you're just taking stills, it's not fast enough to really warrant that, and I would rather have a big cheap card than an uh, expensive smaller card that's fast. So just slide that SD card in right until it clicks, and then close the door there. Now let's talk about the ports on the camera, and I showed you the USB port already. It's hidden over here. USB port is used for data transfer and for charging. You'll be using it for charging all the time. Usually when I want to offload my pictures from my camera to my computer, I'll just take out that SD card and pop it right into a memory card reader on my computer. I usually find that way, way, way faster, especially if you get a USB 3 memory card reader, which I highly recommend. This is a USB 2 port, and that's like one-tenth the speed of USB 3. It feels, when, you, when you're so excited to see your pictures that you just took, it feels so slow to have to wait for that, so I'd get a fast memory card reader. There's also a, a micro HDMI port here, a little tiny HDMI port that you can use to hook up to your television or to an external HDMI recorder, something like the, the Atomos Ninja. You only need an, a 1080p recorder for most of the A7 cameras. If you have the A7S, you can actually get the Atomos Shogun, which records 4K. There's a couple other ports over here that are also related to video. Right in this compartment here, you'll see a microphone and headphone jack labeled appropriately, headphones in green. For recording video, this does have uh, microphone built into it, but it will sound terrible. <laughs> You'll get much better results if you use an external microphone of any kind. Something like the Sennheiser lab mics that I have here sounds really good, much better than you could possibly get by having the microphone farther away from the source. If you are recording sound and you care about the sound, you'll definitely want to plug some headphones in there so you can hear what's going on. Otherwise, there might be wind coming right into the mic or somebody's clothes scratching on something. To record sound, you need to monitor it while you record it. Now let's talk about the process of actually taking a picture. Again, this is pretty basic. Feel free just to skip right forward. But by default, when you turn your camera on, if you haven't changed any settings, you can focus by depressing the shutter button here halfway. Push down halfway, the camera will find focus, and then beep. Then push it all the way to actually take the picture. It'll automatically review it on the back of the screen for you. Super easy. The process of reviewing a picture is also super easy. 
push the play button here and it will show you the last picture that you took. And now you have a bunch of different options. You can see by default, it shows you some information. It shows you the ISO and your f-stop and your shutter speed and some other data. You can display other data by pushing this D-pad up here up where it says DISP. And this will cycle through a couple of different display options. So I push it up once and you can see now it's showing me the picture with multicolor histograms. And I describe histograms in chapters three and four of stunning digital photography. They're so useful for getting your exposure right. And it's the best way to make sure that you get the cleanest possible images. So I do suggest you take some time, read those chapters and figure out what histograms mean to you. Push it up again and you see the picture itself with absolutely no distractions and push it up again and it cycles through that. So you can just keep cycling through. One of the nice things about this camera and really all mirrorless cameras with an electronic viewfinder is that you can take a picture or review pictures just by holding it up to your eye. In that case, you see the exact same thing that you see on the back here in the electronic viewfinder, but not everybody realizes they can review pictures that way. So if you're out in bright sun and you can't really see the uh, articulating tilting display here, then hold it up to your eye and hit the play button. And then you can review the pictures on in the viewfinder, which blocks out the light and just so much easier to review pictures. Let's talk about different ways that you can customize those display options because there are some screens that aren't visible by default for some reason. I don't know. Uh, hit the menu button up here. This is where you access all the menus. And the display settings are on gear page two. So up here at the top, you see camera, gear, Wi-Fi, a bunch of different options. We're going to go to the gear icon here. And then right on page two, you'll see the disp button option here. So I'll hover over that and then click the center of the D-pad here to select it. And now you see I have two options here, the monitor and the finder. The monitor is the back, the finder up here is the viewfinder, so you can configure separate options for each if you want to. So by default, you can see that there are six different possible display settings that I could cycle through by hitting disp here when reviewing a picture, and it shows me four of them. So I could select those others if I wanted to, the graphic display, and for example, the level, which shows me my horizon, and then click enter. So now, while I'm reviewing pictures in real time, I can hit the display here to view different settings. So right now it's on, I think this is the, uh, the details view, that first one I turned on. You can see it's showing me like a graph with my shutter speed and f-stop. If I push up here, it changes, shows me some different data. Push it up again, takes away a lot of that data so it's not as distracting. Cycle again. Now you see my histogram in real time without having to take a picture and view the histogram. You can see it while you're taking it. Especially love using the viewfinder with that. One of the reasons I love mirrorless cameras and their electronic viewfinders better than DSLRs when they can get the job done. Hit disp again. Now the level. Oh, you guys know taking pictures on level is important to me. <laughs> and it's so nice that I can have that in the viewfinder or on live view so easily. And hit display one more time. And now I'll have to use the display up here if I want to actually see through the lens because the back is now dedicated to all the information. And this is actually my favorite way to use it because I'm a, I'm a viewfinder kind of guy. But I love having all the data here, the histogram, the level that I can take a look at whenever I take it away from my eye. So know that you can go in and customize those display options. How you, which you set, how you set it up depends on your own personal preferences. Now let's talk about the different camera modes. These are really important for taking different types of pictures because they let you start to take control of your camera. I bet when they shipped the camera to you, they probably had it on the green auto mode, right? And you'll use that still it, when you hand your camera to somebody else <laughs> to take a picture, somebody who's not familiar with photography. Or if you ever feel like you're getting a little freaked out about the settings and something's going wrong, if for some reason your pictures are coming out dark or shaky, just switch it back to auto. You can always switch back later, but auto lets the camera make most of the decisions and the camera's pretty smart. <laughs> you can definitely do better, but whenever you get scared, switch back to auto. But for now, let's switch it over to A. That's aperture priority mode. This gives you control over the aperture and the lens, which is like the iris of your eye, the, the pupil. It can get big and open up and let lots of light in, or it can shut down really small. So, you know what, I'm gonna switch a lens out here and really show you what the iris looks like. So I'll put this 55 millimeter f1.8 on. Oh, one of my favorite lenses in the Sony lineup, probably my favorite lens, period. And it's just unbelievably sharp. 
and get my cameraman Justin to uh, zoom right in there. So right now it's at F18, which is the smallest f-stop number, which means the biggest opening. It's so confusing the way they label f-stops. But as I increase the f-stop number, here we go past F4 and F5, 6. You can see those blades are shutting down and leaving a smaller and smaller opening. You might not see it as obviously on all lenses, but they all have that same kind of aperture mechanism. So this is at the smallest f-stop, or the smallest aperture, the highest f-stop number, f22. So it's real small, and then I can open it back up to f18 to let in lots and lots more light. Each of those different f-stop numbers will give you different amounts of background blur. Smaller f-stop numbers mean less background sharpness. Big f-stop numbers, lots of background sharpness. Usually, you want to use the lowest f-stop number possible that gets your entire subject in focus. I cover this thoroughly in Chapter 4 of Stunning Digital Photography. Just wanted to show you how to set it on this particular camera. So once you get it into aperture priority mode, you'll change the aperture using the main dial here on the front. Notice that I just turned the camera back on because I turned it off out of habit. On DSLRs, you don't really have to uh, worry about turning them off and on all the time. They'll just go to sleep and you can just leave it on all the time. But with these mirrorless cameras, I do shut them off out of habit whenever I'm done taking a picture and then just turn it back on. Usually it comes back on pretty quickly, so there's not too much of a delay. But battery life can be a real issue if you're out shooting for a full day. So you want to conserve that as much as possible by turning it off and, whenever possible, by turning off this back display and using the electronic viewfinder instead. It just uses a few, little bit less batteries. So aperture priority gives you control over the aperture and lets the camera set the shutter speed to give you the proper exposure. Shutter priority does the opposite. Shutter priority, indicated by the S on the main dial here, lets you control the shutter with the main dial. And as you control the shutter, the camera will adjust the aperture. So as I scroll it to the left here, you can see the shutter indicated here. Here, I'll change the display so we can see it a little bit bigger. So now it's showing the shutter here at one third of a second. As I scroll this main front dial to the right, it gets faster, 1 60th, 1 90th, 1 1 25th, all the way up to 1 8 thousandths of a second. I can scroll it left and go all the way down to a full 30 seconds. You'd use 30 seconds for taking pictures of stars, and that's probably about it. Sometimes you'll even go longer than that, and I'll show you that in a second. Usually for me, 1 60th of a second is good for just general photography, taking pictures of friends at a birthday party or events or whatever you're doing. If you want to take pictures of kids' sports, I'll get up to about 1 to 50th of a second. You always want to choose the slowest shutter speed possible. So you could shoot everything at 1 8,000th of a second, but then your camera would be selecting an unnecessarily high ISO resulting in very noisy images. It's confusing, but I covered in chapter four of SDP. So 250th is good for kids' sports. As they get older, get into high school, they're moving a little faster. <laughs> and you want to crank it up to 1 500th, or even 1 1,000th of a second. If you get into wildlife photography, you're going to want to be at 1 1,600th for flying birds, 1 2,000th for flying birds. Things like hummingbirds, you'll need to get even faster, get up to 1 4,000th or 1 8,000th of a second. But when you're in doubt, 1 60th of a second, pretty good, <laughs> all around shutter speed. Now let's talk about manual mode. Aperture priority gave you control over the f-stop, shutter priority gave you control over the shutter speed. Manual, manual mode gives you control over both. So just take that main dial there, switch it over to M, and now the front dial here controls your f-stop number just as it did in aperture priority mode. To control the shutter speed, you'll use the back dial right here. So you can see I can scroll that left, or I can scroll the f-stop number right. And as I'm adjusting these, note the histogram here. As I'm using a higher f-stop number, it's letting in less light, and so the histogram is moving over to the left. If I scroll it to the left and use a bigger f-stop number, you can see it moves over to the right. Same kind of effect will occur with the shutter speed as I crank it open and crank it shut, it'll move to the left. Now, you can use manual mode with auto ISO. ISO, which we'll discuss in just a bit, controls the sensitivity of the sensor, and it can allow you to take well-lit pictures even in dark environments. By default, your camera will come with auto ISO enabled, and therefore, when you dial in a specific aperture and shutter speed in manual mode, your camera will always expose the picture properly, <laughs> unless you go to such an extreme that it cannot adjust the ISO any further. That's kind of what I was de demonstrating there. 
I use manual mode much of the time. Uh, often I'll just dial in manual mode and then use the lowest f-stop number and whatever shutter speed that I think I need. There is a tutorial in chapter four of sending digital photography that shows you exactly how to use manual mode though. When you're in manual mode, you can also switch it over into bulb mode. Bulb mode is a special feature that lets you take pictures longer than 30 seconds. For some reason I can't explain, camera manufacturers always let you use at most a 30 second long shutter speed. If you want to do a one minute exposure or five minute or 10 minute exposure, you have to go into this bulb mode and you would want to do this for things like night photography in rural environments where there aren't city lights. So you'll access bulb mode by switching into manual priority here, manual mode, and then set the f-stop to whatever you need. And then for the shutter speed, just keep scrolling left past one second, 10 seconds, all the way to 30 seconds, and then one more click over is bulb mode. Once you're in bulb mode, the shutter will stay open as long as you hold your finger down on the shutter button here. So I'll hold it down. You can see, clicks off there. So that time it took a one and a half second exposure or however long I held it down. Now imagine if you wanted to take a two minute exposure, you could sit there and just hold your finger on the shutter for two minutes and then let go. And you would get the picture that you wanted, but you'd probably be pretty bored for two minutes. <laughs> and I bet holding your finger on that shutter would cause the camera to shake and ruin your picture anyway. So that's not really a great way to go about <laughs> using bulb mode. A better way is to use a remote shutter trigger. The USB port that I showed you earlier can also be used to trigger the camera with a shutter trigger. And this is the shutter trigger I recommend. I don't have any bias. I don't get any money from this. I have no relationship with them, but they cost $21. And if you get a fancier one, like a, some wireless thing that you don't need or some Sony thing, it's going to cost you way more. These come under a bunch of different brands, newer and other things. Just get one that looks like this. It's got the like sliding shutter release here. You'll plug it in and then push that up and it will lock the shutter open for as long as you need. Or you can set the timer, 21 bucks. It's a great deal. Everybody should have one. Now I'll say if you have it in manual mode and you got to 30 seconds and you tried to do that one extra click over to ball mode and it didn't work, well, there are a few things that can cause that. Um, you can only enter ball mode when you have it in single shutter mode, not continuous shutter mode. No idea why they do that to you. Uh, you also can't have HDR enabled and go into bulb mode, uh, nor can you have the thing where it takes a picture automatically when somebody smiles. <laughs> if you have that turned on, uh, it's not going to let you do bulb mode, but it also doesn't tell you why it's not letting you do bulb mode. It just doesn't let you get in there. So I just wanted to tell you that if you're having a problem with it. So let's take a look uh, at some of my books. I have three books that are for sale. I already mentioned stunning digital photography a couple of times. It teaches you photographic techniques, the art and the science. It's much more than just pushing buttons and selecting settings on your camera. It's lighting, it's posing, expression, mood, emotion, storytelling. There's so many important aspects of photography that are not shutter speed and f-stop. But it is important to figure out your camera. Once you take those pictures, organizing them becomes hard because you will end up with thousands of pictures. And you know you want to make uh, a card using a picture that you took of your kid at the playground a month ago and it can be hard to find it, or you want to go back four years and find pictures at your aunt's birthday party, Lightroom, Adobe Lightroom is the best software for doing that. It also lets you do most of the editing anybody will need to do. I have a whole book on Adobe Lightroom. <laughs> so check that out at sdp.io slash store or look for these titles at Amazon. You can search for my name. I also have a photography buying guide, which teaches you all the ins and outs of camera gear what all the different features of your camera and lens mean, and how to save some money by buying used gear. If you're not happy with any of these, just let me know and I'll give you all your money back. No time limits or restocking fees. I just want you to be happy with it. No scams. Now let's go over the different shutter modes of the A7 family. There are different ways to set the shutter mode, but the way I prefer to do it is just to hit this FN button here. When you hit that, you get a little shortcut menu that pops up here. It might be different. You know, I'm gonna change the display here so you see. When I hit FN here, you'll see it pops up with this sort of menu. And the shutter mode is this very top left one, the, what they call the drive mode. So as I select that, it's gonna give me a bunch of different options. Single shooting means you push the shutter button down and you can hold it down and it takes one picture. Even if you hold it on forever, it will just take one picture and then stop. Continuous shooting here 
means that you hold it down and it takes pictures repeatedly. So I'll select that just to demonstrate. I'm going to have to take this off of 30 seconds. Here, I'll go back to aperture priority mode. So now in continuous shutter mode, I'll hold the shutter down. It takes pictures pretty fast, right? If th that's the mode I leave it in pretty much all the time. Even if I'm just taking uh, a picture of my family at the dinner table, I'll put it in continuous and then rattle off three or four pictures. Because you know there's going to be one picture where somebody has a face like that or whatever. If you have five pictures, at least you have some options. And it's not like film. It doesn't cost you anything to take the extra pictures. It's really easy to delete the extras. So take lots of pictures and delete most of them. Hit the FN button again and select the drive mode again. And you can see under continuous shooting high, if I go to the right, I can switch to continuous shooting low. And I don't know why they don't spell high and low correctly. <laughs> continuous shooting low is slower. So now when I hold it down, it takes just a couple of pictures a second. If you find continuous shooting high is just too fast and you don't want to dig through all those pictures, switch to continuous shooting low. Me, I don't mind sorting through a couple of other pictures. I'd rather have some extra options. Also in the shutter mode menu, you can see different options for the self timer. So you have two different self timer settings here. Self timer, 10 seconds, and you can scroll to the right and switch it to two seconds, 10 seconds, two seconds. 10 seconds is for when you're taking a self portrait, you have the camera like on a table or tripod and you have to push the shutter and then run around to the table to your family and put your arms around them. And everybody's like counting down 10, jeez. That's what 10 seconds is for. <laughs> Two seconds is for when you have the camera on a tripod and you want to take a very sharp picture, like for night photography. A two second delay allows you to push that shutter button and then the camera sits still and all the shakiness from you touching the camera disappears and then it can take the picture completely, absolutely still. So anytime I'm working on a tripod, I'll switch to the two second mode. Now one down from that, we have another setting that's very useful for, for getting clear, sharp images and for taking self portraits and that's self timer continuous. And this just takes multiple pictures using the self timer. So it, it gets really awkward with that family self portrait scenario when you take one picture and then you have to run back to the camera and start it again because little Bobby like did rabbit ears behind your head or something. You're just running back and forth. So select this. And uh, you can go to the right and see you can take either three images or five images by scrolling the d-pad here. Select three images to take three pictures or five images to take five pictures. And that does the same thing that I talked about earlier where it just reduces the chance of like dirt face in all of the pictures. You're bound to have one that just looks better. The same menu here, I'll back up just in case you jumped in here, uh, allows you to configure bracketing. And what bracketing does is it takes multiple pictures at different exposures. So as we scroll down under the uh, shutter modes, we see four different bracketing scenarios and we're not going to worry about the DRO or white balance bracketing, but I do care about the shutter bracketing basically. What we have here are two options, continuous or single bracket. And for me, I'm always going to use continuous. That means it's going to automatically take all the pictures in your bracketing. So I'll demonstrate what bracketing does because that makes it much easier. But for now, I'll scroll to the right and show you my favorite setting here. For me, it's going to be 2EV3 image. This will take three pictures at two stops, brighter or darker. And if that doesn't make sense to you yet, it will when you read SDP. For now, I'll just demonstrate that uh, by taking a picture of my producer Justin over here. This is the first picture it took and you can see Justin looks properly exposed. Second picture he took is dark. It's underexposed. And the third picture is brighter, overexposed. And that's deliberate. But why would you want to do that? Why would you want to take a properly exposed picture and then an under and then an overexposed picture? And well, there's a historical reason. In the film days, it could be very difficult to know if you had properly exposed your picture. So if you had an important picture, you would definitely bracket it. And then you would just pick whichever of those three pictures was the best because you just didn't trust yourself to meter the situation properly. Nowadays, we get an instant review and we can see in the viewfinder whether it's going to be properly exposed. But bracketing is still really useful for a technique called HDR, high dynamic range. This allows you to blend those three exposures, taking just the best bits of each 
allowing you to shoot a really contrasty scene, like a scene with the sunset behind your friends that might result in the sky being overexposed and your friends being underexposed. With bracketing, you can combine those three pictures and get just really great looking results. Now, all these cameras have HDR built in, but I find they don't do a great job. For me, I'd rather bracket as I just demonstrated and then blend those pictures together using software on my computer. I'm gonna show you how to do that in chapter 11 of Stunning Visual Photography. So now let's talk about the different focusing modes on the A7. You configure the focusing mode in kind of the same way. I'll hit this function button here above the D-pad. And then over here we have the focusing mode. It's the fourth option on the top row here. So I'll select that. And when you get your camera, it's going to be set to single shot AF. And what that means is as you hold the shutter button down, it will find a focus and then, well, let's see. Hopefully it will lock in on something. <laughs> there we go. It finally got focus and it will beep and confirm that you have focus as well as showing some green boxes. But once you have the shutter button down, even if you move somewhere else, it's not going to try to refocus. It locks in focus and then stops as, as, and waits until you take the picture. This allows a technique called focus recompose, where you lock the focus on a subject and then recompose the, the picture so you can have an off-center composition. That's really useful, not so much in mirrorless cameras, but in other types of cameras. But another focusing mode that you might want to think about is continuous focusing. So if you try to use single focus for your kid running towards you, it would lock focus wherever the kid was, but then by the time you took the picture, the kid would have moved and would then be out of focus. So you want to select continuous focusing mode to have the camera try to keep up with a moving subject. So I will hit the uh, function button here and select the focus mode, the fourth item on that menu, and then go down to continuous AF, AFC. And now as I hold the shutter button down, you can see the camera looks at every subject I have and tries to refocus as long as the shutter button here is held down. AFC is not especially reliable on any of these cameras, so you will only want to use it for action, people coming towards you or away from you. Even if somebody were running parallel to the plane of focus here, I'd probably use AFS. Now there is another focusing mode that you should know about, and that is, well, DMF and MF. DMF is dynamic manual focus, and what that means is you can, it will autofocus by default, but then you can also just grab the focusing ring here and focus manually. So you can see as I grabbed it, well, I have focusing aids turned on, so it automatically magnified for me. So it kind of gives you the, the best of both worlds. You can autofocus or just manual focus by grabbing the ring on your lens. I do find that sometimes I'll accidentally hit the focusing ring and then it starts to manually focus and it does the focus magnification thing and that can be kind of annoying. So I don't generally use DMF. Instead, what I'll do is I'll manually switch between autofocus and manual focus. The last option down here, MF, disables autofocus. So now I can hold the shutter button down and it's not going to do anything. The only way for me to focus is to grab the ring and do it manually. And because of the magnification, you can get pretty good results with manual focusing on this. Now let's talk about the different focusing points options. The, these cameras can focus basically anywhere in the frame, one of the benefits of the mirrorless camera architecture. However, the A7 and the A7 II not the A7R or the A7S. The A7 and A7 II have a phase detect focusing system concentrated in the middle of the sensor. And if you use those middle focusing points, it will be much, much faster. So let's talk about what the different uh, focusing point options are. Again, I'm going to hit the FN button here and scroll over to the fifth item here. It calls it focus area. So as I select that, I'll get to pick between all the different options. And in all these cameras, I'll generally use the default option, which is wide. This means the camera will just look at the scene and kind of pick the focusing point for you. <laughs> and th that sounds like a recipe for trouble, right? Letting a, a camera think instead of where you want to focus. But it, it generally is pretty smart about this. And some, but sometimes it'll be frustrating and it'll just pick the wrong focusing point. In that case, you might want to scroll down to the flexible spot. A flexible spot allows you to, I'll select that now, allows you to focus anywhere in the frame, uh, right up to the edges of the frame. And 
when you select that, that's where it's always going to focus. I might have left it in manual focus mode. I did. <laughs> I'll switch that back to AFS. So now as I hold the shutter button down halfway, it tries to focus just on that focusing point. So that was the uh, medium flexible spot. But if you scroll to the right, you can have a large flexible spot or small flexible spot. And the, the difference is really important here. Small flexible spot will give you very precise focus. And that can be really important when working with shallow depth of field. So if you have a nice portrait lens like this 70 to 200 f4, and you want to blur the background on a portrait subject, you're going to want to make sure the focus is exactly on that person's near eye. And if you use a big focusing point, it might focus off the eye somewhere. It might focus on their nose or the forehead. So you can use that small flexible spot to really pinpoint the focus anywhere, whether it's an eye or something else. But the smaller the focusing spot, the slower the focusing is going to be. So it would be very frustrating to use flexible spot small all the time. If you use flexible spot large, you'll find it's much more accurate while still giving you control over the focusing point. I'll just briefly show you the other focusing options here. First, there is a lock-on option here for use with continuous focusing. And what the lock-on AF does is when you select that, whatever subject you have basically in the middle of the frame when you hold the shutter button halfway, it's going to lock on and continue to track that subject even if the subject moves to the, the right third of the frame or the left third of the frame. So that's only for use with continuous shutter, which is why it's disabled here. But it is the way I shoot sports with these cameras. I use that lock on AF. It's the most effective way to, to use focusing. You also have the zone AF, which I don't really use. <laughs> zone allows you to focus either in the left, right, or center third of the frame. You also have center AF, which is actually pretty useful. It just uses the center focusing point. And I'll use that for focus recompose, basically. If I find that the camera is deciding incorrectly where to focus with the wide, I will switch to that center focusing mode. So now I'd like to cover a little bit more about manual focus on this camera, because one of the great things about this camera is you can adapt different types of lenses to it. You can adapt Canon or Nikon or just about any DSLR lens. And because it's full frame, take advantage of every bit of information coming from that lens. It's fantastic but you generally lose autofocus. Now with the Canon cameras, you can buy adapters that will allow you to connect a Canon lens and control autofocus, enable image stabilization, and give you electronic control over the aperture. But the autofocus is awful. <laughs> so I know you're thinking I can get an autofocus adapter for Canon, but you, you really can't. <laughs> the autofocus is slow, so slow and unreliable that you will end up manually focusing. If you want to adapt your Nikon lenses or something else, uh, the, there just aren't adapters that are all that intelligent. So you end up manually focusing anyway. But that's okay because manual focus on, on these cameras is a dream, especially compared to DSLRs. I do want to show you a couple of options for manually focusing. Uh, I'm going to hit the menu button here. And on page one of the gear icon here, we have manual focus assist. And I showed you that earlier quite accidentally. <laughs> but when you have manual focus assist turned on, whenever you start to manually focus, it will automatically zoom in. I don't have manual focus turned on, so I'll go do that now. I'm going to change the focus mode to MF. So as soon as I grab this focusing ring, it's going to zoom in real tight for me. And that allows me to focus so precisely on just any part of the frame because it's zooming in so I see each individual pixel. If you have the camera on a tripod, if you're doing landscapes, this is the best way to do it because it's so, so, so exact. I love that manual focus assist. There is uh, another option here. You can see right below it, there's another option, focus magnification time. If you want the focus magnification to go away after two seconds or five seconds, that's your option. But pretty much it goes away when you have to press the shutter button anyway. So that's, I'll usually just have to press the shutter button. On page two of the gear icon, we have another option here for peaking, focus peaking. And right now, peaking level is turned off. So I'll turn that on. Medium, mid is what I usually use. That works best for me. And let's set the peaking color to red so we can see it a little easier. Focus peaking outlines parts of the picture that are contrasty, that are sharp. And it generally tells you which parts of the frame are in focus. So as we look at my screen here, 
well, you can see the focus peaking is kind of turned on. And so that red line through the frame shows you exactly where the camera is focusing. It's that kind of an angle. So as I focus in and out, you can see that part is moving in and out. And turning the magnification off, let me go full screen on this. You can see the part of this M here is now in focus. If I move the camera closer, it goes out of focus, move it back, and you can see the focus moves through the A and the N. I find that an overall helpful way to get something in focus, but it's not especially precise. Lots of the picture will be highlighted that isn't precisely in focus. So the magnification itself is far more useful, but the, the focus peaking is a quick way to get things in focus, especially for video. I talked a little bit about adapting lenses before in the previous section, but I will go on a little more detail because there are a couple of options that you should know about. Hitting the menu button here on the fifth page of the gear icon, uh, there are a couple of options, especially this one I had problems with recently, and it's APS-C sized capture. So I was using an intelligent adapter intended for Canon lenses to the Sony body. And for some reason, that adapt adapter kept telling the camera all my lenses were APS-C. If you don't know what that is, don't worry about it. <laughs> you can turn this off. So I had it set to auto and it was detecting the wrong setting. Set that to off and any lens you attach will automatically be full frame, even if it's really APS-C. This means if you attach a Sony APS-C lens, you'll actually see a circle. <laughs> uh, but that's okay too. You can always crop it down later. Having it set to auto just means the camera would automatically crop when it thinks it's an APS-C lens. But I bring it up because sometimes it mistakenly thinks full frame lenses are APS-C lenses when they're adapted. So I find it useful to turn that option off. So now let's go to page seven of the camera icon here. And I want to show you the steady shot settings. Only if you have the A7 II model will you be able to configure steady shot inside. That is Sony's image stabilization on the sensor. So if my hand shakes here, the sensor physically moves up and down or twists or moves forward or back to help compensate for my own movement and give me image stabilization with any lens, including a fast prime like this. And it's on by default. But by default, the, the camera will attempt to automatically pick up the focal length. And this will work with all native Sony E-mount lenses. But if you adapt a lens, you need to do this. You need to go into this uh, steady shot adjustment here. Instead of auto, select manual. Now for the steady shot and focal length, you need to set this to the focal length of your lens. So, you know, if you have a 50 millimeter lens, you need to go in there and select 50 millimeters. If you change lenses, you'll have to go in and manually do this. So you'll have to think about this. Now, I don't want to forget that. So <laughs> I'm going to set it back to auto. If you forget steady shot, I find it still is helpful, but maybe it must not help quite as much. Now let's talk a little bit about the metering modes. Now earlier we talked about uh, bracketing and exposure a little bit. It's the camera's way of deciding how bright or dark your picture should be. It kind of looks at all the light in the scene and says, hey, we need to use a slower shutter speed here so that we get enough light, or we need to use a higher f-stop number because the scene is just too bright. Metering modes control the camera's logic, where in the frame it looks, how much it, how important it weights the light in the background versus the light in the foreground, etc. And if you read SDP, I'll tell you just not to worry about metering modes. Instead, I'll teach you to use exposure compensation efficiently. And that's usually the best thing to do, especially because these mirrorless cameras have incredibly intelligent metering selected by default. But there are less intelligent, more manual metering modes that can be useful in some scenarios. So I'll show you how to change those. Now you can see that I, uh, I pushed the FN button here to bring up the shortcut menu. And on the bottom row, second from the left, is the metering mode option. So I'll select that. And here I can switch between multi, which is the default, and the one you want to use. It lets the camera use all of its smarts to figure out how bright the scene should be. Center, which looks just at the middle of the frame, and is literally just a holdover from old film cameras. And the last option here is spot again, just a holdover from film cameras where it meters the entire scene off of a small spot. If you're an old film guy and you love spot metering, go for it. <laughs> but for most of us, the best option is going to be to select multi metering and then dial exposure compensation up or down 
based on the preview that we see in the viewfinder or on the display in the back. So now let's talk about ISO and changing ISO. ISO, which by the way is not an acronym, it's a three letter word that they insist on capitalizing. <laughs> really, look it up, go to ISO.org and check out their about page. ISO controls the basically the sensitivity of your sensor, how given a certain shutter speed and aperture, changing using a low ISO would give you a dark image and using a high ISO would give you a really bright image. And uh, I'll switch to manual mode here so that I control the shutter speed and the aperture and then let me use a little bit faster shutter speed here. Go over to my favorite 1 60th of a second. So now I'm at 1 60th of a second in f2.8 and you can see it seems pretty properly exposed but the ISO here is blinking ISO auto. So I'll switch that over to a manual ISO. And first I'll select ISO 100. That actually looks pretty good. ISO 100 might be the proper ISO for taking pictures of this screen with those settings. I can also go much higher and select ISO 12,800. And now the picture is clearly just overexposed. So hopefully that demonstrates the effect of ISO. And until you really understand ISO, I want you to go ahead and just select auto ISO. Now, chapter four in stunning digital photography teaches you all about how to use ISO and when you want to use it. And ISO does have a profound effect on your pictures. If you use a low ISO, ISO 100 on this camera, you'll get very clean images. If you use a high ISO, like ISO 6400, you'll get very noisy images that have specks of red, blue, and green in them, and that can ruin a lot of pictures. So ISO is something to be aware of, especially once you get to be a little more advanced in your photography and you're really controlling the settings. So that's how you change it. It's just the directional pad here and push it over to the right. It's labeled right there. You can also assign it to a shortcut button, but that's usually what I do. I'll show you later how you can control it with this D-pad here. That's uh, actually my favorite thing is to assign it to this dial so I can turn the dial and change the, the ISO. Why am I teasing? I'll just go show you how to do it now. <laughs> I'll hit the menu button and then on the gear icon here, page six, Go to custom key settings. I know it's not a key, it's a little confusing, but you select it and your first option here is control wheel. So I'll select that and then go up to ISO. So with that selected, I'll jump back here and you can see just by scrolling this wheel, I can quickly control my ISO. And this gives me a level of control I really don't even have on DSLRs because I can control in manual mode, the aperture using the front dial, the shutter speed using the back dial, and then the ISO using this thumb wheel here. I love that I have three dials at my fingertips. Now I'll talk about exposure compensation. Yes, even another dial <laughs> on this camera. Exposure compensation works just like bracketing. If you're looking at a picture, you're looking through the viewfinder and you're like, oh, this picture is not quite bright enough. The histogram isn't coming close to the right side. You can make the picture brighter with exposure compensation. So to demonstrate this, I'll go into P mode, program mode, which is just like an automatic mode and it's not something I really recommend using. It lets the camera take control, but it's a good opportunity to show you how exposure compensation works. So now the camera is making all the decisions about the camera settings and you can see, I want that white to be fully white. If I look at the histogram, you can see nothing is even approaching the right side of the histogram. That means the picture's underexposed. I'll grab this exposure dial here and crank it up plus one. Now I'll take another look and you can see it did indeed move closer to the right. So let's move it up to plus two. With each click, it gets brighter and brighter. Now at plus two, I can see it's almost touching the right, which is what I always want to look for. That's going to give me the cleanest images possible. So now my picture's ready. I can just take it. So what you want to do is look through the viewfinder and look at the histogram. And if it's not bright enough, crank that exposure compensation dial up. But then when you're done, when you've taken that picture and you're happy with the results, dial it back down to zero. Otherwise, the next time you go to take a picture, you're going to still have it on plus two or minus two, and you're going to ruin a picture without even knowing it. If your picture is too bright in the viewfinder, if you're blowing out details, if somebody's face is overexposed, just go down to negative one or negative two. But underexposed pictures are much more common than overexposed pictures. Now I'll talk about white balance. Good news, it's another setting you never need to think about. 
if you don't want to. I'll show you later how to set the camera up to take raw pictures, and raw pictures allow you to edit the white balance in post perfectly without losing any data, and that means that's something you can think about later. <laughs> and white balance is just one less thing that you don't have to think about when you're taking a picture. So you can think about the composition and the art of it. But if you do want to change the white balance, I'll show you where. Hit that function button so this menu comes up. And then on the bottom row, third in, you see it right now it says auto white balance. But this is the white balance setting. So I'll select this and I can go through a bunch of different pretty self-explanatory settings depending on the light in my scene. You see, this table's white, right? <laughs> it looks white to me, but if I, right now I'm under daylight balance light, so this would look kind of like the sunlight. But if I turn on the incandescent lights, it would actually be a little bit yellowish. Or if I took it outside in the shade, it would end up being a little bit blue. You don't see it that way. You always see it white because your brain adjusts automatically for it. Your brain has like auto white balance built into it, as does the camera. And so that auto white balance works really well. And I generally just leave it at that. And then if it guesses it wrong, then I fix it in post. But if you're the type who wants to control every single setting, that's where the setting is and you can go in and adjust it. I'll talk about the diopter, which is really important for glasses users or anybody who accidentally pushes the diopter. <laughs> so this diopter here, it's right next to the electronic viewfinder. And if you're a glasses wearer, I wear contacts, but I often wear glasses. And when I take my glasses off, um, I, I, I hate to use the viewfinder with my glasses on because I can't put it right against my eye. And it's just kind of uncomfortable because it's pushing against my face. And I like to hold the camera against my face, it helps steady it. So I'll take my glasses off and adjust the diopter until I can see perfectly in here. So what you'll do is this little dial here, you can adjust it up or down, hold the viewfinder to your eye, and then adjust it until those numbers at the bottom of the screen are perfectly crisp and sharp. And then when it is, you're good. Now, the other reason you might need to adjust the diopter is because somebody accidentally turned that diopter. It does get hit accidentally every now and then. And you can diagnose that by uh, when you hold up the camera, everything is blurry, even the numbers at the bottom. People freak out. They're like, why? They think their camera won't focus sometimes. Probably just the diopter. Look at the numbers. If the numbers are blurry, repeat that process. Hold it up to your eye and turn the diopter until everything is sharp. Now I'll talk about briefly about recording video. And as I said, I'm going to have a whole separate video about recording video with the a7s because it's such an amazing video camera but all these cameras take very capable and good hd video the record button is the worst feature on this camera <laughs> they're so good at video i don't know why they buried the record button here but it's kind of this way in all the cameras and it's like flush and it's really hard to push so you can pretty much just set your settings and hit the record button and it will record video for you you even have the ability to like focus during video. It will it will follow the same rules that you have for focusing. So you can manually focus. And if you have it in an automatic mode, it will automatically adjust the settings for you. Um, I would suggest switching it to manual mode and manually setting your ISO uh, and your aperture to get the results you want. Then set your shutter speed. Well, first set your set. set set your shutter speed to either 1 60th if you want to shoot 60 frames a second or 1 30th if you want to shoot 30 frames a second. These cameras support 60 frames a second and so I suggest you take advantage of that. 60 frames a second video is beautiful and if you have to view it at 30 frames a second you always can. 60 frames a second you can view it in 60 frames a second on YouTube and everything looks so nice and smooth. It also lets you slow it down into slow motion. There are a few video settings that I just want to show you. This varies a little bit between the different camera bodies, but I'll show you where they are. On the camera page two, we have a couple of different options here for video, file format and record setting. So file format gives you three options. MP4 is the worst, XAVCS is the best, but as I select that, you'll see I'll get an error message that tells me my memory card isn't fast enough. So if you want to record that high quality video, you're going to need a fairly fast SD card can cost a little bit more. Most people won't notice the difference, but if you're picky about your video, you'll want to use that. AVC HD offers very good codecs. So when I select the record setting right below it here, you can see I have a bunch of different options. I have 60 frames a second at 28 megs, which is excellent. 60 frames a second is good quality. I can also go to 24p, which is more what you would use for 
film. 24p is traditional for film. So if you're trying to simulate a film look, you drop to 24p and then set your shutter speed to 1 50th of a second. If you don't mind that video look, I prefer it. Go to 60p and set the shutter to 60 frames a second. There is also a dedicated video mode here on the dial that you can switch to, which can be helpful, but you also don't have to do that. Now I'll show you how to format your memory card. You will eventually fill up your memory card and run out of room. And at that point, you want to copy all the pictures to your computer and format it so you can use it again. It's not like film. It can be reused many, many times. To format your memory card, hit the menu button here. Then go to the toolbox, page five. Top option there is format. So I'll select that. And it asks me if I want to delete all my pictures. I'll scroll up and then select enter. And it will just erase everything from the memory card. If you do that accidentally, there's a tool called PhotoRec. P-H-O-T-O-R-E-C. Google that. It's available for Windows and Mac and like Linux and everything. Put your memory card in your computer and it will probably be able to recover your pictures. Just don't take any more pictures with that memory card after you format it. Now, I promised I would show you how to shoot RAW. RAW is a tremendously useful format. You, you can shoot in two formats. JPEG, which compresses your pictures down and makes it more difficult to edit. Or RAW, which gives you every bit of data that the camera collected about the scene in a way that's easy to process, allowing you to pull down highlights that would have otherwise been blown out and raise shadows in a way that doesn't introduce quite as much noise. You can also adjust the white balance and do other editing tasks. Really easy. Uh, applications like J JPEGs are ready to share. You can drop them right on Facebook. But the RAW files are very easy to share. You read them into an application like Picasa, which is completely free, or Lightroom, which you have to pay for, but which is more powerful. These apps process your RAW files and allow you to easily export and share them as JPEGs after you've edited them. So to turn on RAW, lots more information in Chapter 4 of SDP, I'll hit the menu button there, and then it's like the very first setting. <laughs> That's how important it is. So I'll go to the camera icon here, page 1, and the third option down, quality. You can see it's set to fine. What I'm going to select instead is raw. Now, even if you don't know what raw pictures are, you can select raw and JPEG, and then it will save the files as both a raw file and a JPEG file. But I would suggest just shooting raw and getting at least Picasa, the free app. Because if you start shooting raw now, even when you don't know how to use it, later, when you figure out how to edit your photos in raw, you'll be so glad that you can go back and do more edits to your pictures especially when you're learning, you might be underexposing or overexposing pictures. And saving them as RAW instead of JPEG can allow you to save the picture later. It's a great, great tool for learning too. So you notice when I was focusing, it would beep a confirmation. I despise that. <laughs> Maybe because I'm a wedding photographer and I'm all dressed in black and trying to be stealthy and not disturb the, the happy family. But then you hear everybody with their stupid cameras going beep. Beep, beep, beep. I hate and despise beeps. I just cringe every time it beeps. So I would like everyone in the world to turn off the beeping on their cameras. It, it visually shows green and stuff. So you get a visual confirmation. You don't need that extra auditory confirmation. Hit the menu button here. Go all the way over to the toolbox on the first page, right at the bottom. Audio signals. Set that to off, please. <laughs> or at least take the volume settings and crank it way down. But just, you know what, just... Just turn the sound off and get used to it. <laughs> I beg you. Now I'll show you how to assign the custom buttons. As you get deeper into photography, you'll find yourself accessing functions in the menu regularly. And navigating those menus can be a pain. Fortunately, you can assign all these different C buttons. C, C1, C2, C3, and C4, the trash can down here, to do different things. They're basically shortcuts. So I hit the menu button here to get into the menu system. And then on the gear icon, page six, I can go down to custom key settings. And this is the same place I configured the control wheel. You can see I have custom button one, two, three, four, and the center button, as well as I can configure the directional pad here, what happens when I push it up, down, left, or right. Those are kind of labeled, so I usually leave those <laughs> set, though you see the down button isn't set by default. But let's just take a look at custom button one. By default, it's set the white balance, and I never change white balance. So let's reset that to something different. 
I'll select it and we can browse through all the different options we, ha we have here for uh, changing different configuration settings. So one thing that you might do on a regular basis is, uh, I'll scroll up here, is uh, change the steady shot settings. If you're, for example, putting on manual lenses, that's something I do a lot. So I can just select steady shot adjust here. And now when I hit C1 here, it's going to pop me right into that option. So I can set it to manual right away. Now, that doesn't actually change the focal length, <laughs> but I could also set C2 to adjust the steady shot focal length. Anyway, you don't have to do that. But browse through all those settings and see if there's a setting that you access more often than the white balance. And do that for all the buttons and get your camera all customized. Now we'll talk about how to enable back button focus. Normally, you focus by half depressing the shutter button here, the camera finds focus, and you take your picture. But that can be frustrating. That's that's okay if you want to do focus and recompose, but if now you want to track a moving subject, well, you'd have to go in and change the camera mode. It's also frustrating when you're doing night photography. Sometimes you want to focus on something and not have to refocus the camera between every picture. With the default settings, the next time you wanted to take a picture, the camera would automatically try to refocus because you'd have to half depress the shutter before you could fully depress the shutter. And at night when it might take five, 10 seconds to focus or it might not find focusing at all, that's so frustrating. Back button focus is an incredibly useful way to make your focusing more efficient. With back button focus, you can push the shutter and take a picture and the camera won't try to focus. Instead, whenever you want to focus, you can push, for example, this button here and use that to focus. So to turn on back button focusing, there are two separate settings. I discuss it in chapter four of SDP. So if you get the book, you'll have a better understanding of, of why you'd actually want to use it. But on the gear icon, page four, go down to AF with shutter. That means when you have to press a shutter, do you want it to autofocus? And by default, it's turned on. So we'll turn that off. And at this point, there'd be no way to autofocus the camera. So we need to assign autofocus to some other button. And that means we're gonna go back to page six here and go to the uh, custom key settings and pick a button to assign to the back button focus. And my favorite button to use here is the AF MF button. So you'll select that and set it to AF on. Might already be set to that for you. So I'll just make sure I have, I have it in manual focus. So I'll switch this to AF C. So now you can see I push the shutter button halfway here. It's not trying to focus. But if I push this button, now it is trying to focus. And only when I push that button will it try to focus. Back button focus, tremendously useful. Takes a little getting used to, and every time you hand the camera to somebody else, they're gonna be a little baffled. But once you get used to it, you will never wanna move back. Now I'll briefly show you where the Wi-Fi settings for this camera are, because not all of them have Wi-Fi, but this one in particular does, and it can be kind of useful. <laughs> There's some applications that it can download directly from the internet, uh, or you can use Wi-Fi to connect it to your smartphone to transfer pictures. So I'll hit the menu button here and all the Wi-Fi settings are under this third icon here that looks like the famous Wi-Fi symbol. What you'll probably do most is select send to smartphone. So select that and then select whether you wanna pick your pictures on your phone or on the device. And for me, it's always easier to select them on my smartphone. Select that and it's gonna start up the Wi-Fi system and then it tells you your SID and the password that you need to use to connect to it. So what you'll do is you'll pull out your smartphone and open up the Wi-Fi settings, connect to that, and then open the Sony app. So you can get the, the Sony app for your phone. It's free. And it will communicate back and forth and allow you to browse your pictures, save them to your phone, where you can upload them to Facebook and such. I won't walk you through that process because everybody has a different smartphone and my settings wouldn't be the same as everybody else's. I will cancel that and go back into the menus here and also show you that you can get to the internet from this so that you can connect to the store. So you see what I did when I connected to the store there, it said I haven't configured a network yet. So it will automatically take me to the network settings. And so I'll select that and 
then I'll select access point settings. Some routers have support WPS and you can just push a button and it will synchronize. So if you know that, <laughs> you can select WPS push. But if you're not sure, you can do it the old fashioned way. Just select access point settings. It allows you to browse the different networks. Fourth coffee there seems like a pretty solid signal. And then uh, you get the, the pleasure of kind of entering in your Wi-Fi password using this terrible, terrible keyboard here. I'm just going to turn that away from the camera <laughs> while I enter it in because I don't want you guys driving in my driveway and connecting to my Wi-Fi and doing anything nefarious. So now that I've selected that, I'll click OK and it will connect to my Wi-Fi. Really, the only reason you want to use it is when you're using one of the apps. But once you do that, it will connect to the Sony Entertainment Network and you get to browse some of the different apps. At times, I found their website can be slow or even unbearable. But you do see there are some cool apps in here, like something that will do time lapses for you. Many of these are free. Some of them are not free. Select all here to see all the different apps, because by default it just shows you the new ones. So for example, the direct upload app here is pretty useful and it's actually free and you can use it to upload pictures directly to Facebook which is actually easier than going through your phone sometimes. <laughs> it can be a little bit unreliable. Anyway, I don't want to spend too much time on the Wi-Fi part but that's where it is. Feel free to browse through, check out the different apps and uh, use them to share your pictures instantly. Now I just want to go over a few different lenses, some selections that I really love in the Sony lineup. Uh, up first, this is my favorite lens in the lineup, and I have it currently attached to the camera. It's the expensive <laughs> Carl Zeiss 55mm f1.8. It goes for about a grand, and it's the sharpest lens in the lineup. And in fact, it, of all the different Sony E-mount lenses, the current ones, it's the only one that's really what I would call sharp. So if you're not satisfied with the sharpness of the images that you're getting with one of the other lenses, check out this 55mm. It's a prime lens. You can't zoom it. But the images you get are incredible, and at f1.8, it's good enough for some pretty good background blur. If you want a whole lot of background blur, a whole lot, I suggest checking out a really fun lens. It's, it's the most fun lens I own, and that's the Zhongyi Miticon 50mm f0.95. So first, yes, you can go have f-stop numbers below 1. This heavy piece of glass, oh my guess so heavy, is totally manual. You have to adjust the aperture up here and focus it manually. There's no autofocus. It's all completely manual. But the background blur you can get out of it is crazy. It's a lot of fun to use for that reason. And if you get into like taking videos at night, especially on the A7S, it can be absolutely amazing. So do check it out if you're a manual kind of guy. If you want to do some nice portraits, the best native lens for portraiture is the 70-200 f4. This is a, the classic kind of zoom range that I use for portraits on every other kit. And, you know, it's very expensive. At $1,500, all these lenses are so expensive for some reason in the Sony lineup. But it's pretty lightweight compared to the 7200s I'm used to. And uh, it does a pretty good job. Sony recently announced their Super Zoom, a 24 to 240 lens. And it's also not super sharp. But... For travel, which is my favorite thing to do with these Sonys, it provides unlimited versatility. The ability to shoot a wide-angle 24mm picture and then zoom all the way into super telephoto 240mm, so you never have to change lenses. You're prepared for anything. This goes for about a grand. You can get all these at these links up here. It just takes you to Amazon, and I'll get a few pennies to kind of thank me for my time. But also check out eBay. You might be able to find some of these used. Another good lens. Well, I kind of wanted to warn you about this lens. The Sony 24-70 is $1,200, very expensive, it's f4, and because it's more expensive and because it's f4, people tend to assume that it's sharper, actually hair sharper than the kit lens that probably came with your Sony, the 28-70. to So the only reason I really recommend this lens is if you find 24 millimeters is just not wide enough and you don't want to get that super zoom, but for most people, this 24-70 to is not going to be a good value. 
Another lens that I, a lens I do recommend is the 16 to 35. This is a super wide angle lens. It's not, again, the sharpest lens, but it's okay. But if you're doing landscapes or even travel photography in a place with tight streets like Europe, old Europe, Rome, for example, you really kind of need to be wider than 28 or 24 millimeters. This is an excellent complement to the kit 28 to 70. So if you find you want to go wider, I would probably grab this or the 24 to 240. But 16 millimeters allows you to shoot just about anything. Another manual lens that I really like for the Sony lineup is the Rokinon 24 millimeter f1.4, and it's perfect for astrophotography. Being 24 millimeters, well, you could do that with one of the other lenses, but it's at f1.4, which means it's letting in like six or eight times more light than the kit lenses would, and that's perfect for taking pictures of stars. It's really, really fast. You're not going to get a huge amount of background blur at 24 millimeters, but it looks just great and it feels good and it's unbelievably sharp. It's sharper than any of the Sony lenses except for this 55 millimeter. I love this lens. You have to manually adjust the aperture and focus. It doesn't do anything automatically, but overall a great lens. You can get it natively for Sony E-mount, but you can also get it for Canon or Nikon and then buy like a cheap, like $15 adapter to put on your Sony. That's something you might consider doing if you think you might sell it in the future because I think the Canon or Nikon versions of it will have better resale values. And because you have to, it's all manual anyway, you don't lose anything by putting an adapter on it. So think about getting a Canon or Nikon version and then adapting it to your Sony just to make it easier to sell in the future. Another Rokinon lens is the 14 millimeter F2.8 that I have attached to my little Sony A6000 here. And whew, look at that front element there. <laughs> Isn't that cool? This is a, extreme wide-angle lens, but it's not fisheye. So it's great for those city streets. And, and like the other Rokinon, it's completely manual. You have to adjust the aperture using a ring here and focus here. But if you want to go wide, super wide, <laughs> it's a really fun lens to use and it gives you great and sharp results. And it's way cheaper than that 16 to 35. Focusing doesn't have to be that precise, so I never mind manually focusing a super wide-angle lens. One of the first things you just have to get is a tripod. And here's a $50 tripod. You can spend thousands or well, hundreds on a tripod anyway, but this $50 one will be a great starter tripod. And even if you get a better tripod in the future, you'll still use this for travel. It's nice and versatile. It's the Dolica. Uh, go to scp.io slash Dolica to check it out. And that wraps it up. I hope you found this useful. You might have to rewatch it a little bit later after you get some more practice, but the most valuable thing you can spend your money on isn't necessarily lenses or uh, even figuring out the buttons on your camera, but it's learning the art of photography, post-processing, and how to get the most bang for your buck by understanding photographic gear. So I hope you'll check out my books. You can go to sdp.io slash store, or just look them up on Amazon. You can see more free videos just by clicking subscribe. And if you click like, that just lets other people know that this was a good quality video. Thanks so much. If you have any questions, add a comment. Bye.